The final stage of leadership is the born leader. You cannot climb to the top of the pyramid. After you have engaged in stages two, three, and four long enough and well enough, others will simply push you up to the top and begin to refer to you as a born leader. Let's evaluate the various stages and what they are based on. If you're a barbarian, it's based all on power and subjugation. If, on the other hand, you're a benign leader, it's based on position and title. The benevolent is based on personality, the builder on productivity, the believer on people development, and the born leader on pure, raw passion to achieve the goal, a passion that is infectious. How do others feel about you at the various stages? If you're a barbarian, they hate you. If you're benign, they ignore you. If you're benevolent, they like you. If you're a builder, they respect you. If you're a believer, they love you. If you're a born leader, they revere you. They talk about you in hushed tones. You're like a living legend in their eyes. Why do they obey you? At the bottom, they have to obey. If you're benign, they obey when they feel like it. If you're benevolent, they don't mind obeying. If you're a builder, it makes sense to obey. Now notice the change in verbs. When you're a believer, they eagerly follow you. And at the born leader, they can't help but follow you. They say things like, I'd follow that man into hell with a squirt gun. If she was going after Jaws in a canoe, I'd jump right in beside her and pack tartar sauce. <laughs> what are they committed to? If you're a barbarian, they are committed to keeping this job until they can find another one. If you're benign, they're committed to their paycheck and nothing else. If you're benevolent, they're committed to a friendship. If you're a builder, they commit to the company or the organization. If you're a believer, they commit to you personally. And if you leave, they're likely to just follow you right on to a new company or a new organization. But when you get to the top of the born leader, they commit to the mission. That is where you want to be. Because when they commit to the mission, you can leave and they won't follow you. They will keep right on building the organization as passionately as you ever did. You can vacation and not worry about it because they're going to run the organization as passionately as you ever have. You can retire and the organization will keep right on growing without missing a beat. In the third century BC, the Greek philosopher Aristotle defined what he called the three qualities of a highly influential person. And keep in mind, leadership is nothing other than the ability to influence other people's behavior. The first, he said, was ethos. Ethos is the word from which we get our word ethics. It refers to your honor and your integrity. You must be honest at the molecular level. There was a management study that I read about years ago in which a survey had been conducted of 30,000 frontline employees from every conceivable profession. They were asked, what quality do you most demand in a boss? There was one quality that finished first or second on every single one of the 30,000 surveys. It was integrity. They want a boss they can trust. And one of the greatest little serendipities of life is that honesty not only makes you happier and more trustworthy to other people, it is also profitable. Ethisphere magazine annually produces a list of the 100 most ethical companies in America. The 100 of the Standard & Poor's 500 viewed as most honest and ethical by consumers. And they compare the 100 against those 400 presumably less honest competitors. You know what they discovered? In 2006, they discovered that the 100 ethical companies outperformed the other 400 by 370% over a five-year period. Why? It's simple. People want to do business with people they know aren't going to rip them off. In 2010, they did a similar study and discovered that in that single year of 2010, the 100 most ethical companies saw their stock price rise by 53%, while the other 400 on average saw theirs decline by 4%. That is a massive difference. You must be completely ethical and honorable in order to make it to the top of the pyramid. Secondly, he said it was logos. That is the Greek word for word. It is the word from which we get our word logic. It refers to communication. You must communicate constantly and clearly everything that is going on in the company that you possibly can let out into the public sphere. 
I mentioned Greg Brenneman of Continental Airlines a few minutes ago. Another thing Brenneman did to change the culture at Continental was this. He said when he arrived, the company culture at Continental was tell nobody anything unless absolutely necessary. He instantly stood the whole thing on its head. He said, starting now, we will tell everybody in the company everything that we're thinking unless it is absolutely essential that we keep it a secret. And so he and Gordon Bethune went onto the tarmac and loaded bags with the baggage handlers to tell them where the airline was going and get their feedback. And then they would go to the ticket counter and they would help sell tickets and check bags and talk to the ticket agents. And then they would go down to the gate and they would talk with the gate agents and they would get on the plane and they would talk with the pilots and the flight attendants and tell everybody everything. They feel included. Now they're a part of the team. Because they've been communicated with, now they're going to go out and fulfill the vision because it becomes partly their own vision and not just the boss's. When you fulfill a dream, you have to communicate. Now let me ask you a question. Is a great dream caught or taught? Well, it's a trick question. It's both. A football coach has a dual responsibility. If he's the head football coach, one, he has to make sure the players know how to play the game properly. They know the blocking schemes, they know how to run the routes, the quarterback knows whether to take a three or a five step drop, the receiver knows exactly what position on the field to turn around, the running back knows what hole to hit. They gotta get their timing right. But secondly, he must inflame the players with a passion to win. If you do one without the other, you never get the results that you need to get as a great leader. A dream that is taught but not caught is drudgery. A dream that is caught but not taught is anarchy. A dream that is caught and taught leads to victory. You've got to do both. Thirdly, Aristotle said, you have to have pathos. This is the Greek word from which we get our words empathy and sympathy. It refers to feeling, and in particular, we would translate it as passion. You must be absolutely enthusiastic and passionate about fulfilling the dream. And it has to be a noble dream. It can't be about you. If your dream is all about getting rich and powerful yourself, your people will never buy into that dream. It has to be a noble and a selfless dream. Raise your hand if your boss is in the room right now. Okay, you, sir. What is your first name? Nick. Nick, who's your boss? Matt. Where's Matt? Matt's way up there in the back. Okay, Nick, what company do you work for? American Profit Recovery. Okay, is it a collections agency? Okay. Let's suppose that Matt called you into his office, Nick, and said, Nick, I just want you to know I've got my eye on you. You're doing a wonderful job. Let's suppose that he took out a map of all of this entire area, and he began to put little pins in the map in places where you have offices and where you might have offices in the future. And let's suppose he began to talk excitedly about collections opportunities across the nation. And then let's say, just for the sake of the illustration, he reached under the desk and pulled out a globe. And he began to spin it wild-eyed and foam at the mouth as he talked about opportunities in collections around the world. And then said, here is my pledge to you. Nick, if you will work hard, if you will give me your absolute best effort, if you will come in early every day, if you will skip all of your breaks and work through lunch, if you will work late into the evening, every evening, if you will skip your days off, if you will work through your weekends, if you will sacrifice your vacations, if you will sacrifice your family, your home, and your personal life on the altar of this collections company, one day all we've talked about will be mine. Would you find that particularly motivational? No. You see, Matt's dream has to go way beyond amassing praises, raises, accolades, and promotions for himself. His dream has to be a noble one. His dream has to be at least in the best interest of humanity or of the employee, or people won't buy into it. Secondly, your dream has to be huge. It has to be a big dream. Don't have little dreams. I believe impossible usually means no one has thought creatively enough, believed passionately enough, or worked diligently enough to make something happen. It's as though there are two columns in our heads, one of which is headed with the word possible and the other with the word impossible. Under possible, we list those things anyone has ever done before. Under impossible, we list those things no one has yet been able to do until someone does one of them. And then we shake our heads in amazement and we shove it from the impossible over into the possible column. And eventually what used to be considered impossible is not just possible, it is now the new standard by which everyone else is measured. The best example I can think of is Roger Bannister. 75 years ago, it was almost universally believed that a human being could not possibly run a mile in under four minutes. 
Doctors wrote books speculating that if a person ran that fast, their heart would stop under the strain. But then on May 6, 1954, Roger Bannister broke that fabled mark, and an amazing thing began to happen all over the world. Records began to fall everywhere. A paltry three weeks later, a fellow Briton by the name of Diane Leathers became the first woman in the world to run a five-minute mile. Three weeks later, yet an Australian by the name of John Lanny, running in a track meet in Finland, became the second man to run a four-minute mile, and he did it faster than Bannister had done it just a month and a half before. By the end of 1957, just two and a half years later, 17 people worldwide had run a mile in under four minutes. Let me ask you a question. Does it make sense to believe that that many world-class milers got that much faster in that narrow a window of human history? Or does it make more sense to believe that the only thing that really changed was what they believed was possible? And any one of the 17 could have been first if only they had believed it was possible.